Sorry about that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Adam, and I'm the Senior Park Interpreter for Whiteshell Provincial Park. The Whiteshell is located on Treaty 3 territory. That's the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Métis Nation. I want to thank you all very much for joining me this morning to learn a little more about, uh, personally, one of my favorite animals in the white shell, the timber wolf. But before we get too far into things, the first thing I would actually like everybody to do while you're at home is close your eyes and listen to this sound for a little bit. love that noise even that early in the morning. So that was of course a wolf howl or a number of wolves howling. Take a second in the chat window just to enter some of the thoughts or emotions you had the second you heard that noise. Take some time now to enter those. For myself personally when I hear wolves howling I actually think of back in my childhood. I used to stay at the uh, family cottage for the summer and we'd always sleep in the big screened in porch so you could hear all the nature. And around the end of August going to bed, that's when I would start hearing the wolves howl a little more. And it was actually looking back kind of a bittersweet thing. I mean, sweet because wolves, cool, <laughs> but bitter because I knew that meant it was the end of August and that meant I'd have to go back to school soon. So what did you guys think? I just gotta lean in quick. Here we got peaceful, haunting and beautiful calming and reminded me of hiking and camping. There's my favorite one. Cool. <laughs> so those are all great answers. But it shows you right there how just one noise can evoke different thoughts and different feelings from all different kinds of people. But it's still that same noise. But it's important to remember that that noise was almost rendered mute. Wolf and wolf howls are probably one of the most iconic sounds of the wild in true connecting us to wilderness. And by appreciating and learning a little bit more about wolf behavior, we can preserve that noise for the next generation to enjoy, just like we have today. So let's dive right in and take a look at our subject of the day. This guy right here is the gray or timber wolf. Kind of hard to get him completely in shot here. And this is actually a small one too. An average male can be about 140 to 160 or 70 pounds, and females about 30 pounds on average lighter. Now, I said the timber wolf, as I said, gray and timber wolf, same name, uh, different names for the same animal. Now, this guy out in the white shell is top dog, literally. Now, that being said, if you do happen to encounter one of these, you don't want to run up and pet it. Even though our furry friends at home, our pet dogs, came from these guys, these are large wild animals, so you don't want to approach them if you see them, because like I said, they are top dog. They're a predator, and they have no natural predators. And one of the ways they accomplish that is mainly their diet. Now, the diet of a wolf is, uh, in my opinion, really, really cool. They're a little different than other animals. Things like black bears, this is a black bear skull here. Black bears are actually kind of like us. They're omnivores. They eat a variety of meat and plants, actually most of their diets plant matter. And if you look at their teeth, it's actually pretty similar to ours. They have the flat molars towards the back and the big canines up at the front. We have canines too, right up here, but they're quite a bit smaller. Wolves on the other hand are completely different. Every single tooth in that wolf's mouth is designed for tearing apart and eating meat and flesh. That's 100% of what they eat. No salads for these guys. So that then begs the question, what do they eat? Their primary diet are ungulates. Ungulates is a fancy term for all of our hoofed and antlered animals. So for the white shell, that means white-tailed deer. Now in other areas where you have other ungulates like Nopaming Provincial Park, which is directly north of the white shell, they also have moose and caribou, and that'll serve as a diet for wolves up in that area. 
Now, one of the cool things, we're going to bust some myths towards uh, wolves towards the end, but there is actually one myth out there that is true. And I'm sure after the holidays, even though we're all confined to one household for our dinners, we probably heard this saying a time or two. I know I did, which is funny because it's just me and my wife. Don't wolf down your food. I'm sure we've all heard that at some point. This is actually true. Wolves can eat a lot of meat in one sitting. Take our online poll right now to see if you can figure out how many pounds of meat a wolf can eat just at once. Is it 10 pounds? Is it 25 pounds? Is it 30 pounds? The answer might surprise you. In any case, for humans, that's a lot of food. So we'll just leave that up for just a sec to see if you guys have any idea how much these guys can actually eat. All right, our survey says, let's see, we got a few of you thinking 10 pounds, a lot of you thinking 30 pounds, and a good portion of you thinking 25 pounds. Well, for those of you that selected 25 pounds, you're correct. I know there's not much of a difference, but 25 pounds is on average the amount of meat a wolf can eat in one sitting. For perspective, that's about one sixth of their weight. So that would be someone like me eating 40 pounds of meat in one sitting. I eat a lot of food this holiday season, as you can clearly tell, but not quite 40 pounds in one sitting. The reason they have to do that is because unlike us, wolves don't know when their next meal is gonna be, and they might not be able to eat every day. So they have to eat as many calories and as much meat as they can all at once to make sure that they can survive to their next meal. Now, this is what's interesting about all the different ungulates. One animal can actually last an entire wolf pack a pretty long time. An average wolf pack is about six to eight wolves. One deer can last a pack of wolves for one week. Now in other areas where you have caribou and moose, because they're a little bit larger, they can last even longer. Two caribou can last a wolf pack an entire month and one moose can last wolves about six weeks. That's over a month, that's a month and a half just from one animal. That's a pretty good score. Now, before they start eating these animals, they have to catch them. This is one of the things that makes wolves really, really unique because they can work together as a pack in a group. Now, ungulates, primarily white-tailed deer, especially for here in the white shell, they're very fast. Wolves are fast animals too. They've been clocked in at running um, anywhere between 55 to 60 kilometers, which is about the average speed limit for vehicles inside cities. Now that's pretty fast, but wolves can't maintain it that long. It's kind of like a sprint. So if one wolf is chasing down one deer, even though deer can run about the same speed, they can maintain it a lot longer. So as long as the deer's got a bit of a head start on the wolf, that one wolf isn't gonna have a great chance. But you have four or five of those wolves this is where it gets more interesting. In a big open area, sometimes you can have two wolves chasing down one deer. Then as those two wolves start getting tired, they'll teeter off and two new wolves will come in. All the while that one deer is still running at that speed and eventually they can chase down that deer and eventually get some dinner. Now that doesn't work too well in the dense bush. It's kind of hard to zigzag in between all those trees. So the main way that wolves get food in the white shell is actually by using the stalk and ambush method. And this method was so efficient that indigenous peoples actually adopted it as their hunting method. Stalk and ambush is pretty self-explanatory. They try to get as close as they can to the animal. And then right as soon as they get close to it, they ambush it and get it all at once. That way they're using the least amount of calories. Cause like I said, they don't know when their next meal is going to be. Now the way they can do this and work together as a team is because they have a really sophisticated communication method. Of course they howl. Now they howl for different things. At different points in the year, they can howl for communicating with other pack members. They could be warding off enemies. And especially around this time of year, they're howling basically as a mating call. 
I mentioned that in August earlier on, that's when the pups start howling a little bit more. That keeps increasing until we get to January. So right about now, this is the best time to go out and listen or try to howl for wolves. And I said the main reason they're doing that is because they're looking for a date. This is wolf mating season. Now the wolves howl so much in January and February that the indigenous peoples in the area actually named their January lunar cycle wolf moon because that's when the wolves are the most uh, active vocally. Now howling for wolves is a really, really cool activity to do. I'm going to take you to a quick tutorial on how to do that once you're out in the park, but first I got to get out of this office. So let's take a look at how we can actually howl for wolves. are excellent trails to howl off of. They both have great scenic overlooks where your howl can travel a great, great distance. Increases the chance of a wolf hearing you and howling back. Next, how we're going to actually howl. Yes, there is a method to this. For starters, we have to have the right wolf howl stance. So you wanna stand with your feet, shoulder width apart, just like this. Shoulders back, not chest puffed out, but just shoulders back standing straight up, and one thing you don't want to do is lean your head back like this to howl. Did you see how my voice changed when I did that? When we lean our heads back, we can put a lot of strain on our vocal cords and potentially damage the back of our neck. Two things we for sure don't want to do. So once you've got your howl stance, the next thing is to let out just a nice long howl using your diaphragm, just like this. As far as the howl goes, nice and simple. Don't be self-conscious about your howl. Whether it's high pitched or low pitched or maybe sounds a little different than everybody else, just like with humans, wolf howls all sound different. So don't worry about sounding weird or anything like that. Now once you get to your location, the first thing you want to do is actually the hardest thing. Stay in silence for two minutes. I know this will be a challenge, especially with little kids, but that is the first thing you do. Now next, after those two minutes of silence, you want to let out one solo howl. Then you wait 30 seconds in silence. Then you let out another solo howl. Now after another 30 seconds of silence after that, you all howl together as a group. You wait 30 more seconds, one more group howl, and then after one last 30 seconds in silence, you let out one more solo howl. After that, wait in silence for about two to three minutes. After about two to three minutes, if you haven't heard anything, you're probably not going to. So you have two options. You can either stay in that location in silence for another 10 to 15 minutes, not exactly the most desirable option, especially with it being cold out. You want to get moving and keeping warm, so the best thing to do is head to another location. Again, that's why Pine Point and McGilvery Falls are great for this. There's tons of different places to howl from. Always nice to get outside around this time of year. <laughs> now wolf howling is one of my favorite things to do and if you follow all those you'll have a really good chance of hopefully hearing some wolves especially if you're in a small group. Now one thing to keep in mind is when you're looking for a location on either of those trails Pine Point and McGilvery Falls are great options. One thing is really key is you want to get somewhere up nice and high. 
uh, one of the cool adaptations of wolf howls is that they can travel a long, long distance. For example, in a dense wooded area, a wolf howl can travel about nine to nine and a half kilometers. If you're up top above the trees or just in a big open area, a wolf howl can travel almost double that. It's about 16 kilometers. So good luck to you. Hope you can hear some wolves when you're out there. But one thing to always remember is if you do hear some wolves howling back, even if it's really loud and it sounds like it's right beside you, it probably isn't because it's very far away. And they can decipher an actual wolf howl from humans imitating a wolf howl. If you hear a wolf howling back at you when you're doing your uh, wolf howl as a group, it's probably more inquisitive. It's probably asking, who are you and what are you doing? <laughs> always a good thing to keep in mind. However, that idea was not really always shared by a lot of people. Really, as long as there have been wolves around and people have known about them, there's been myths and fears, mainly built on misconceptions about wolves. A lot of these coming from European settlers as they immigrated over in the 1800s. Prior to them leaving, they had done a pretty good job, unfortunately, of eradicating wolves over in Europe for a variety of reasons. One of the reason being uh, fear of their livestock, wolves preying on their livestock. When they came over to Manitoba in Canada, unfortunately, they brought those fears with them and proceeded to start to do exactly the same thing. Thankfully, they didn't succeed. The wolf did not become extinct in Manitoba. And because of a lot of conservation efforts put forth in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the wolf number in Manitoba is actually at a fairly healthy number. Province-wise, uh, we figure there's about 4,000 wolves in Manitoba, and in the white shell, there's about 100 to 150, spread over six to eight packs. Now, for a park the size of the white shell, 2,700 square kilometers, that's a really good healthy number, and we want to keep it that way. And the way we can do that is by learning more about wolves, and gaining an appreciation for them. So just by listening to this video today and interacting with me, you guys have done a great first step towards that. But there are some other things you can do after we wave bye-bye this morning. One thing is when you're reading nursery rhymes to your kids, make sure you make the kids aware that the wolf is not actually the big bad wolf or the bad guy. By all means, read nursery rhymes to your kids. <laughs> but make sure they realize that those are stories and wolves aren't actually the bad guy. Another thing you can do, because this is very popular right now in parks, when you do come out onto trails, make sure you pack out everything that you pack in. Don't leave any garbage, don't leave anything that could be an attractant. While we don't have to worry about wolves coming up and stealing our sandwich, that is not gonna happen. One thing we do have to be aware of is if we leave attractants behind after we leave, we can still accidentally attract animals to that area and habituate them. And we don't want to do that. Another thing we can do is, like I said, learn more about wolves and appreciate them. And the last thing I'll leave you with is a quote by a fellow by the name of Chief Dan George. Uh, he was an indigenous elder from out in British Columbia a while back. He's since passed away. Interesting fellow. After we're done this, uh, Google him up. He's very interesting. But he has a couple of really good quotes, especially with this one I'm going to read you right here. One thing to remember is to talk to the animals. If you do, they will talk back to you. But if you don't talk to the animals, they won't talk back to you. Then you won't understand. And when you don't understand, you will fear. And when you fear, you will destroy the animals. And if you destroy the animals, we will destroy ourselves. I wanna thank you all very much for listening to me talk about wolves, one of my favorite things to uh, talk to people about this morning. And if anybody has any questions right now, we can do our best to answer them. Thanks, Adam. The first question is from Rachel. Uh, what is the best time of day to howl for the wolves? Uh, the best time of day is actually in the evening. Wolves are nocturnal. They're not active during the day. Uh, you may see them during the day, but they're mainly active at night. So a real good time to do it would be at some point, uh, really anytime after dark, which we have a wide window for now. Eight or nine o'clock is a really good time to start. Our next question is from Carrie, who asks, are wolf packs a matriarchy, family-based, or is there merit to the phrase alpha male? <laughs> 
So wolves are a, uh, the wolf packs are family based and they are matriarchal. That's actually one of the uh, big myths about wolves is that it's, it's the alpha male, the alpha male calling all the shots. Not the case. It's the alpha female that's in charge and she's the one calling all the shots. Uh, another question from Rachel. Uh, why would there have been a lone wolf getting really close to campers at uh, Nunamak Lake last summer? Is it more worrisome when they are not shy? Well, anytime you have a predator that, uh, like a wolf or a bear that is not shy of people, that's definitely a problem. So a couple of things could have happened. When you see lone wolves around, um, usually it's one of two things. One, it's a teenage wolf off on their own for the first time trying to find their own pack or their own habitat or it's an ex alpha male or alpha female that's been kicked out of the pack by the next generation coming up when they're hanging around a campground that's definitely not an ideal situation the reason they're doing that is because there probably are a lot of attractants out so if we keep all our attractants locked up not only are we going to keep things like bears away everybody knows about that but many people don't realize that things that will attract bears will also attract wolves and other animals that we don't want coming through our campsite. So as long as we keep all of our attractants locked up and away while we're out camping, we shouldn't have to worry about that. A uh, question here from Susan who asks at West Hawk, where are there the most wolves? We have never heard them between June and August. <laughs> Yeah, so between June and August, that's actually one of the times that wolves are actually pretty quiet. It's not till around the end of August that the howls will increase. There are wolves around that area. We know there's especially one pack kind of around that West Talk caddy area. So there are definitely wolves around. Uh, just because you don't hear them doesn't necessarily mean they're not there. Uh... Julia asks, what do you do if you come across a wolf on a trail, say if you're walking or even on a snowmobile? Okay, so if you encounter a wolf when you're on a trail, for starters, 99% of the time, the wolf is going to run away. Similar to a, if you encounter a black bear in the summer, you've stumbled across it by accident, and they are terrified of us, so they will take off. If you encounter one that doesn't immediately run away, you want to do the same thing you do if you encounter a black bear. You want to keep yourself as big as possible, avoid looking at it in the eye, talk to it, and slowly back away to another direction. Uh, that's all of our questions for now. Looks like all of our questions. All right. Well, thank you very much. As I said, this is always one of my favorite topics to talk about. And always remember, when you do visit parks, to follow COVID-19 public health orders. Only visit with members of your household. And if you do meet up with friends, make sure you keep that group below five people and practice the fundamentals of physical distancing, including wearing a mask. So again, I want to thank you all very much for listening to me. And I invite you to register for our next webinar coming up on Wednesday, January 6th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. It's all about a Pine Ridge Christmas Eve. But one last time, thank you very much for listening to me today, and I hope to see you at our next webinar.